end of Exodus chapter 4, it's a little bit like taking our last breath before the plunge. The end of Exodus chapter 4, Moses and Aaron have made their way back into Egypt. They've started to talk to the elders of the people of Israel, the Hebrew children. And as they do so, they say everything that God has told them to say. They perform the signs and wonders before the people of God. And the end of that chapter said, and they believed everything that Moses and Aaron said, and they worshiped God. It was a wonderful way to end that chapter. But now as chapter 5 opens, now it's time for Moses and Aaron to not just talk to the people of Israel, but to do the one thing that Moses has been especially called to do, and that is to take the word of God before Pharaoh. So Moses and Aaron now are going to begin to take God's word to the man who hates God's people and believes he is more powerful than the God of the Hebrews. So then we've got to ask the question as we prepare for this chapter, how do we think that conversation is going to go? So this chapter begins the open conflict between God and Pharaoh. Three things are going to begin to collide in this chapter, and these things will continue to work against each other until we make our way to the Passover and the Exodus itself. These three things that are colliding, we have the will of God on one hand and what he will do with his people. We have the will of Pharaoh and what he refuses to do in the face of God. And caught in the middle, we have God's faithful servants and we have God's people. So this is the conflict that we watch develop now that starts in Exodus chapter 5. So what will we see happen in Exodus chapter 5 in our passage this morning? A couple of things to help give us some guidance. First of all, godless rule. The rule of Pharaoh, the tyrant, not just without the one true God, but in fact openly against the one true God. We haven't seen this Pharaoh yet up close, but now we get Moses and Aaron there and we begin to see his character. The last chapter said that his heart was going to be hardened or his will, his character is going to be strengthened and strengthened against the will of God. And this is the Pharaoh that we begin to wrestle with now over the next several chapters. His character is very clearly anti-God. It's anti-God's people and it is pro-Pharaoh. That's that's the character and will of this man. The text is actually explicit in this passage of Scripture. This Pharaoh defies the God of the children of Israel. We're going to talk about godless rule, and I think there's some really interesting things that arise out of the text for us this morning. And the second is this, and this happens right at the end of this chapter, but by the time we get there, we're going to feel this happen. We're going to talk about the value of lament. The value of lament. This is where our chapter ends. No longer in uh, belief and worship, and we're excited for that, but in Moses going to God and lamenting about what is taking place. Lament has value for us as well. In fact, lament is going to set up the power of God through the next several chapters. Moses is going to rely on, and he's going to encourage the people of God by that very power. So let's begin reading Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me, In the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. 
The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Some of your translations just literally say, for they are lazy. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Part of what Pharaoh is telling the people of God is what Moses and Aaron are telling you, what your God pretends to tell you, these are lying words. I'm the guy in charge. So Moses and Aaron now make their way to Pharaoh for the very first time. And they, they open with the salvo, roughly what God had told them to say when God, when God is talking to Moses at the burning bush. Let my people go that they may hold a fast to me, a feast to me, excuse me, in the wilderness. So Moses and Aaron begin with this demand. It's not exactly what God had told Moses at the burning bush. Moses is going to return to that and actually quote God to him the second time that Moses makes this demand. But it's time now, Pharaoh, for you to let God's people go. Now, Pharaoh, the tyrant, his reaction is exactly what we would think a tyrant's answer is going to be to exactly this kind of demand. Who is the Lord? And note in your text as well, we talked about this when we were at the conversation with the burning bush. What's the name of the Lord? Whose name shall I give the people of God? Who, what's your name um, so that I can tell them who sent me? God said, I am that I am. I am is the one who sent you. And there we get the name Yahweh. So in your Bibles, when Lord is all capitalized, that's the Hebrew for the name of God. So Pharaoh says, I don't know this God that you have named. Who is this Lord that I should actually let you go, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Pharaoh the tyrant believes he has absolutely no reason to obey this God who has this name that he's never heard and these people that he rules over. Now we need to think for a minute a little bit like Pharaoh is thinking. We need to put ourselves in his place for a moment or two to try to understand how incredible this scene really is. When we talk about ancient empires and pagan empires, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Greek, the Roman, and so on and so forth, the gods of those empires, the gods of those nations are intimately tied to the physical nation itself. Not just the ethnic nation, but the physical nation. So the concept is, the smaller the borders of that nation, the smaller and weaker those gods are. The larger that nation is, the larger its expanse and exercise of power is, the more powerful those gods are. So Egypt is not a small nation. Egypt is the empire that rules their known world in this day. So as far as Pharaoh is concerned, he thinks the gods whose names I know rule the world. They are the most powerful gods. We've been destroying everyone else's gods. And so now the representatives of a slave nation they have no high political hierarchy. They have no economic power. They have no national borders at all. And here come these two presumptuous Hebrews before Pharaoh, and they say, our God is telling you, you need to let us go. On top of that, Pharaoh, Caesar, all of these ancient leaders see themselves as minor deities as sons of God. So Pharaoh's going to believe that he wields a certain kind of divine power on earth. So all of this is inside of Egypt. All of this is inside of Pharaoh. He sees no other God that he has not yet destroyed. And now slaves come to him and demand release in the name of Yahweh. So this is incredible to him. Who is this Lord? I don't know your God. I have no reason to obey him. 
Now, I think this is important for us, especially as we watch this this conflict between God and Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt and the way that God eventually builds and shapes his people because God is taking his people from a slave race to a nation who will be built and founded and shaped by his character. And we're starting to watch that conflict unfold. So we have to watch this happen in chapter five and as it moves to the next several chapters. Every nation worships God or some other gods. And I'm not talking about ancient nations. I'm talking about all nations. Nations today either worship or are guided by the one true God, or they worship and are guided by other small g gods. And who we worship makes all the difference. The character of those gods, the characters and the values of those religions shape the values of that nation and the people in that nation. So the way the Egyptians God, Egyptian gods work is going to shape the way Pharaoh and the Egyptians think. Who the God of the Hebrews is is going to shape who they are and their character. So everything from culture to media to politics to education to the way we think about family and human sexuality will be shaped by who we worship. So God is beginning to pull his people out of a nation that worships pagan deities and he's going to shape them by his character and by his power. So this conflict is real. We cannot assume that the world that we are accustomed to can be superimposed on ancient Egypt. It can't at all. It was a completely different value system. And what we have inherited comes from the way God builds his nation in the book of Exodus. So Moses and Aaron, they repeat what God has told them to say. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness. Now we know God's ultimate goal is complete freedom for his people, but this is where the conversation begins with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh responds again, why do you take your, the people away from their work? So the tyrant again responds, when what he sees is an attempt to get out of slave labor. I need these people. They work for me. I have no reason to let them go. Pharaoh's building projects, and that's literally what it is. His building projects are more important to him, and he's going to cling to that. Something we mentioned at the very beginning of this book that, that we should remind ourselves of now is Pharaoh is always associated with stone and bricks and building because that is what he is trying to do. Moses is always associated with water and God always shows up in fire. It's just one of these wonderful literary quirks inside of the book of Exodus. But Pharaoh has his own tower of Babel to build. And that's what this is. Human arrogance, human strength, hubris with power is the building of an ego, is the building of a Tower of Babel. What do we mean by the Tower of Babel? It reminded me of this story, and part of it here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. Here's why human beings build monuments to their own capacity. Then he said, or excuse me, then they said in Genesis 11, verse 4, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And humans continue to do this, right? It's not, it doesn't look like ziggurats anymore. It's our strength and our technology and our economic leverage and power and whatever the case may be. But humans without God are constantly doing this. Let's build this and push this to make a name for ourselves. And it's always done in the face of God. So Pharaoh's decision with the people of God is to make it harder on them instead of easier. His reaction to God is to make it harder. This is important for us. Tyrants respond to God's authority by punishing God's people. Tyrants respond to God's authority by punishing God's people. 
It's as if a tyrant is going to think something like this. Well, if they think they're going to worship someone else, if they think they're going to work for someone else, if they think they're going to live by a value system that's different than mine, then I'm going to make them suffer for it. Now, this is actually not all that surprising because this is what human sin does in our individual hearts when we are convicted by the Holy Spirit of our sin or convicted at the moment of salvation. Oftentimes, what sin does in our heart individually is, I refuse to be ruled by God. He will not be Lord of my life. I will be Lord of my life. This is what sin does in our individual hearts. This is what sin does when it has power. Does that make sense? This is what sin does when it has power. It actually makes life hard on the people of God. Any political ideology that denies God in his place in this world reduces him to some form of personal preference or the only space that God has in our world is inside the walls of a church. And when we walk outside of the walls of this church, we're not allowed to carry our Christian faith with us. Any political ideology that does that means that they are becoming little gods themselves and demand obedience. Modern secularism is just the latest form of paganism. I've decided this myself, therefore it's true. I'm just letting you know that. We call it secularism. It's just the latest form of paganism. The church cannot be allowed to be the church in public because it conflicts with our power and ideology. So when sin has power, and God wants his church to follow him instead of the world, what does the world decide to do? Make it hard on the people of God. So something else begins to boil to the surface as we learn about, as we learn about the work of God amongst his people and the work of his people inside of the world at large. And this is interesting. Freedom depends on the knowledge of God. Pharaoh actually makes this point for us himself. Pharaoh openly defies the word of God. Who is the Lord? He says a sentence later, I don't know this Lord, this Yahweh that you are talking about. Contrast that. With how, with how Moses responded to the burning bush. When God begins to talk, of, talk to him out of the burning bush and calls him, Moses' response was, I love this, who am I that you would call me? That's a different reaction to God than who are you? Who are you? I don't even know you. I'm the one who has power here. Two completely different responses. And there's a lot of this kind of stuff inside of Scripture. I was drawn to a chapter in Job. As Job is talking in the voice of the wicked who rise up against God. This is part of what he says in Job chapter 21, verses 14 and 15. This is the way the wicked think. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. My goodness, if you watch Twitter lately. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Who is this guy? I don't know him. I've got a better way to live. But scripture is also clear that that defiance of God simply will not last. We go to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And the prophet Isaiah says this, and the haughtiness, the arrogance of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away doesn't matter 
It doesn't matter what else humans worship. It doesn't matter what excuse they give to deny the Lord. There is only one true God, the great I am. That's it. He is the bottom line of all history. It's the bottom line of all creation. There's a, there's a Jewish philosopher. He's still alive today. He's a philosopher and an economist. His name is Leon Cass. He's written a great big giant book on, on Exodus. And this is part of what he says, commenting on this passage of scripture and Pharaoh's reaction to God. He says this, where human rulers do not know the Lord, their subjects will not be free. Despotism is a child of ignorance of God. So the knowledge of God, as opposed to what Pharaoh says, what Moses says before God, the knowledge of God becomes the foundation of a free and just society. And the more it is lost, the more control individual, individual humans try to have over other human beings. They take the place of God. We're watching this conflict begin here in Exodus chapter five. And what God is doing is he's building a nation of people who are built on the knowledge of him. The great I am, the God of all power and might. But God is not going to defeat a weak nation. He's going to defeat the strongest nation possible. So Pharaoh is just gonna to continue to say, there's no way, there's no way. You think God's gonna have his way? I'm going to have my way. Verse 10 of Exodus chapter five. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, complete your work, your daily task, each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done all your task of making the bricks today and yesterday as in the past? So the Egyptian leaders go to the foremen of the children of Israel who are themselves Israelites and they mock the voice of God and they say, thus says Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron had walked into Pharaoh's throne room and says, thus says the Lord. Pharaoh says, well, I'll tell you who's talking now. You have to keep it up and this time you have to go get all of your own straw. More work, same quotas, beat the leaders. This is exactly, this is actually the exact structure that the Nazis used in their concentration camps with the Jews. They would set some of the Jews over the others and then they would beat them as an example to the others. So the tyrant just makes things harder and harder and harder on the people of God. In verse 15, the story continues, but now the consequences of what's happening to the rest of the Hebrews makes its way to Moses and Aaron. Verse 15, then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, or Pharaoh said, you are idle, you are idle, you're lazy, you're lazy. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you. but You must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them and they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses is now caught between Pharaoh, God's will and his people. 
So this is Moses' response in verse 22. And Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. So the foremen of the people of Israel, they go and they complain to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh reacts exactly like any tyrant would to blame the victim for the crime that he has perpetrated. They have very real reasons to cry for relief. This is a real issue. We can't just skirt over how difficult life is becoming because Moses and Aaron have gone and spoken the word of the Lord to Pharaoh. And this is Pharaoh's response. This is real hardship. And as, they're, as slaves, there's nothing that they can do about this. Now, Moses did not promise them freedom tomorrow, but he did tell them, God will free you. But the evil of Pharaoh will resist God as long as he is able. What else would we expect from sin that has power? I will not allow anything else to be God. I am in the place of God here and now. So he's going to continue to resist. It's exactly what we would expect. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh goes, you know what, Moses and Aaron, you're right. I've been a mean guy. I think I'll let your people go. And the book of Exodus becomes about six chapters long, and we're done. But this is exactly what sin does when it has power. So the Israelite foreman, they realize what's going on, that they're not going to get relief from this, from the extra pain that is laid on them. So they go meet Moses and Aaron who are waiting to hear the result of the conversation. And they say something that's actually pretty difficult probably for Moses and Aaron to hear. God is your judge, Moses, for what's happening to us right now. That's how they put it. This is now between you and the Lord. We don't understand what's going on here. We try to get if we can't, this is because you went to him and talked to him. Things are harder on us now. The Lord look on you and judge you for what you have done. This actually reminds us a little bit of the mockery and anger that Moses received all the way back in chapter 2. When he goes out and he sees um, an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrews, he kills the Egyptian man. The next day he goes out, he sees two Hebrews fighting one another. He tries to break it up, and their response is, who made you judge and ruler over us? And that's what sent Moses fleeing into the wilderness in the first place. This kind of complaint can only be part of Pharaoh's plan to create this division and create this hatred and anger amongst the people of God. What strikes me about this passage of Scripture is then what Moses does. And I think every piece of what Moses says in verses 22 and 23 is important for us to understand biblically. And Moses turned to the Lord, and he began to lament. He laid all of this out before the God who met him at the burning bush, before the God who showed him all of these signs, before the God who said, I will free my people, it hasn't happened, things have gotten worse, he lays it out before God. So Moses openly complains. He wonders why he was sent. He wonders why even more evil is happening to his own people, why they have not been delivered. We've seen this already, and we'll see this more in the relationship between Moses and God, but Moses is not afraid to complain before God. At the burning bush, the very first time he talks to him, he's got all these issues and questions, and I'm not sure about this. I don't think I'm the right guy. No one's going to hear me. He finally gets there. Pharaoh responds with evil, and he goes, why did you send me? Why is there just more evil happening now? The end of chapter 5 represents a kind of hitting the very bottom before we get to the plagues and start climbing out of the land of Egypt. They've been slaves for a long time. 
But now they're e- it's even harder on them because of the promise of God. So Moses struggles with this. We've gone from worship and belief at the end of chapter 4 to complaint and lament at the end of chapter 5. So I want to talk about this. Moses laments to God. He does not understand the increasing pain of his people. He doesn't understand the power of evil, especially when God said he was going to free his people. And he doesn't understand at this point the seeming silence of God. Lament is a biblical idea. And lament is surprisingly common in Scripture. And it arises out of exactly these kinds of scenarios. So I want to talk about biblical lament. Biblical lament happens when we express pain or sorrow to God. Biblical lament is not necessarily an open door to gripe against God and then just walk away, but to bring our confusion and our pain to him knowing he hears us. Knowing he hears us. This is biblical lament. And we see this pattern over and over in Scripture. How does biblical lament work? Biblical lament expresses three things at once. Love for people, evil committed by humans, and confusion about God. This is what biblical lament expresses. And I'm going to imagine the more that we talk about how this works, what Moses says, some other passages of Scripture, some of you are going to think, ah, that's what I feel. That's what's been going on in the back of my brain in my relationship with God. Biblical lament expresses these things all at once. First, love for people. If Moses didn't care about the Israelites, he would not be bothered by their pain. So it is the love for his fellow Israelites. It is our love for those who are within our family and friend circle or injustice we see or the pain and confusion that we have in our lives. It rises to the surface and it's significant to us. We want it fixed. We want it changed, but we don't have the power to do it. And yet we're walking with this great God who has promised his abundance and goodness and freedom to his children. And so our love for the people involved in pain drives us to God. Something needs to be done. So biblical lament begins actually with love for, connection to, care of those who are around us. And it reacts as well to the evil of human beings. Moses knows Pharaoh is to blame. He says, he has done evil to your people. But he still sees it in the context of the one great God. He still sees God involved. And so he's taking this evil that's happening and he's taking it straight to God. You see this evil. I see this evil. The people I love are suffering from this. This has to be brought to you. We do not practice biblical lament when we simply blame everything on God and then walk away. That's not biblical lament. That's the way freshman philosophy students work. I'm skeptical of God. I don't understand him. He must not exist. That's not biblical lament. I don't understand what's going on. I love these people who are in pain. Very real evil is taking place. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this to my God. This is biblical lament. We're learning this. And the third thing that biblical lament is dealing with is this confusion about God. God told Moses, Moses told the people of God that he was going to free his people. And the very first thing that happens is that things get harder instead of easier. But again, we expect this. 
A tyrant is told that God will overrule him, so the tyrant pulls out all the stops. This is why even in our culture right now, we feel this more and more. This is why more of the trainings that you have to go through at work cut against the grain of your faith, maybe even in ways you haven't yet been able to exactly express. This is why the rules and the laws that we're expected to live by, the celebrities and politicians make things harder and harder on Christians because God wants to be Lord over all. And there's a worldview in our culture right now that has said, I don't know this, Lord. I am God. So now we have a battle of the gods. Remember the three things that are coming into conflict in this passage, the will of God, the will of an evil man, and who's caught in the middle? God's faithful servants. God's people are caught in the middle. And let me push on this just a little bit. If you don't feel that tension right now, you should ask yourself, what do I really believe? Who is telling me what to think? Whose worldview am I holding to if the world is an easy place for me right now? There's gonna be no confusion about God if you feel no conflict with the world. But there will be confusion about God if this world is a difficult place, if we see evil around us, if we feel it, if we experience it, and we know the promises of God, and we know who he said he is, and yet things aren't happening the way that we think they should be happening. The Hebrew children are still in slavery, and it's an honest and a very real lament. I have always believed that one of the powers of the Christian worldview that makes it a stronger, more rational worldview than any other religion that I have studied, have studied is that it takes evil seriously. It doesn't deny it. It doesn't say it is an illusion. It doesn't say there's a way to simply uh, bypass it with some sort of exercise. It runs straight into the face of evil and says, the God that you worship is greater than that. None of it is unreal. Your God is even greater than that. The Psalms are full of these kinds of conversations between the psalmists and God. Psalm chapter 10 is one of those. Psalm 10 verse one sounds like what Moses says here. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourselves in times of trouble? There's a lot of lament in scripture and you and I need to know God is not put off by it. He doesn't turn his back on you when you express this to him. When you take this to him, God does not say, well, there, there, you just don't understand. God actually engages with this. He responds to this. And God's final and ultimate answer is he pulls his people closer to himself even when it doesn't feel that way right now. So biblical lament is not screaming into the darkness. It is prayer to the God who is there, the God who is greater than everything we will ever face. Friends, listen to this. Biblical lament always ends with hope because it is always directed at God. I'm not saying tomorrow everything's gonna be fine but it always ends in hope because it's always directed at the one true God. Another one of these Psalms that is this pattern of lament, Psalm 102, the first two verses go like this. Hear my prayer, O Lord, learn my cry. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. I need you to talk to me now. And the psalm goes on and on like that. And we get to Psalm 102, verse 12, about halfway through the psalm. But you, O Lord are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. So what the psalmist does when he laments, 
So he takes it to God and then he reminds himself of who God is. He expresses his pain about what his enemies are doing to him, about how his friends have betrayed him. And he says, but you, O Lord, have not been changed by any of this. So I'm going to lay this at your feet, and you are alone king. Does God answer Moses' lament? Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Why did you send me? Why is this evil happening? Why haven't you freed my people? And God's answer answers is, now you're going to see what only I can do. Now you're going to see what only I can do. Moses uses this tension at the end of his life when he's talking to the people of Israel. They've, they've gone through the Exodus. They've, they've had the Ten Commandments given to them. They've wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, and they're now on the very border of the Promised Land. And on the other side of that river, there are giants in the land. And so as Moses begins to talk to his people, gives his final sermon, the book of Deuteronomy, early on in chapter 7, Moses actually says, and when you cross this river and find the giants in this land, I need you to remember what God did when he brought you out of Egypt with a strong arm. I need you to remember that he brought evil down on the heads of those who wished you evil. I need you to remember who God is is. Moses even uses this moment later on to remind his people. The apostle Paul, this incredible moment when he's writing to the Thessalonians, he says, we do not weep as people who have no hope. That means we weep, but we have hope because of the one true God who exists and who is greater than all of these things. There is nowhere else to go to. There is no one else to go to with whatever pain it is that we carry. There is no other hope than God and God alone. Let's pray.